Hi, it's Wednesday the 14th of April 2021 and welcome to our second episode of Conversations in Computational Photography, a new series by the Alice Camera team exploring innovations in computational photography, deep learning and artificial intelligence and how they can be applied to uh, consumer digital cameras. I'm Vishal Kumar and I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Alice Camera and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, let me introduce you to our CTO and other co-founder, Liam Donovan. He's a PhD electrical engineer who's the chief technical architect and innovator behind the Alice camera. Hi, Liam. Hi, Vish. Thanks. The second person joining us today is Ollie Baker. He is a computational photography engineer who's a graduate in physics and certainly knows his way around cameras, having invented the Franken camera too, which he took to Kickstarter at the age of 18. Hi, Ollie. Hi. Great. Okay, so the topic today, uh, this week, is uh, electronic stabilization. You know, sketching out the problem in a bit more detail. Um, when cameras capture images, sometimes your hands uh, shake, uh, and it can, you know, make the photos unusable or, or, or make uh, the, the image kind of unstable. Uh, and photos can end up being blurry as a result. But also, you know, when you're moving the camera, your body movements mean that when you're recording videos. Uh, sometimes footage can end up being quite shaky. Uh, and to correct for this, uh, cameras use stabilization techniques. Um, and there, there are mainly kind of three, three main stabilization techniques. I guess on one hand, you have more of the uh, hardware mechanical solutions, such as optical image stabilization and in-body stabilization. Uh, and you can also use gimbals and other kind of uh, hardware solutions to, to stabilize the, the camera. Uh, on the other hand, you have software techniques uh, such as electronic image stabilization. And, and what we're going to do is talk about these techniques and talk about um, how tr traditional cameras uh, use these techniques, but also what we will be doing with Alice. So to, to kick it off, Liam, uh, what is optical stabilization and in-body stabilization? Sure. So both of these techniques are uh, very mechanical solutions to the problem of stabilization. Um, and they are the techniques that are kind of used most predominantly in uh, professional cameras um, in this day and age. Um, and so with optical image stabilization, uh, you actually have one of the glass elements of the lens of the camera, um, which is able to move uh, to redirect the light um, to compensate for your movement of the camera. Um, so it's quite, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible technique, really, and very impressive, but it can actually work, I, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, it needs to be very precise and very, very fast, uh, very accurate in order to actually work, but it, it does work very well. Um, certain manufacturers are better than others, but it, it, it's all about actually physically moving one of the lens, glass lens elements to compensate for the light. Um, uh, the other technique, uh, uh, also very popular, is in-body image stabilization, also known as sensor stabilization. Uh, and that's where the actual image sensor is moved uh, physically mm. to counteract uh, uh, the, the motion of the camera. Um, so there will be an, a little electronic sensor, a gyroscope uh, in the camera, um, which will be connected directly to a bunch of little motors, very small, very fast motors, which actually move the sensor in, in up to five axes of motion to counteract um, uh, to counteract camera motion and, and remove motion blur from the, from images. Typically, actually, this is a huge selling point when, when you're buying a new camera. Uh, you know, camera companies will sell sell you IBIS, and actually, the differentiation between a camera without in-body stabilization and with in-body stabilization can be an order of magnitude um, higher in terms of cost. Uh, in fact, I'm using a Sony A6600 at the moment to, to, as my webcam camera, and that has IBIS. Uh, but the Sony A6400 does not have IBIS, but the cost differentiator is, is quite substantial. Uh, and you know, obviously, the cost differentiator is not just because it has IBIS and versus it doesn't. But it's a it's a kind of you know expensive solution. Um, and a lot of the times, uh, and you know, there's uh, optical steady shot which Sony has as well, and and some lenses have um, these motors that, that control for it. But sometimes it's not actually that good. Uh, I've used video footage on. Oh, I've tried to vlog on, you know, my 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 camera uh, as I'm walking through Hampstead Heath with my kind of vlogging uh, stick, and uh, the the footage is really unusable sometimes. You know, uh, even even when I am using uh, I, when IBIS is turned on, and when optical steady shot is turned on, uh, it's really unusable. Um, now 
why, why is why is that? I don't, you know, why is there certain issues with, with uh, stabilization? Yeah, so these mechanical solutions uh, really work best for stilts. Um, they 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 really work best where you you're because um, they compensate for your handshake, so they actually allow you to use longer shutter exposures without getting motion blur from from handshake, and that's where they really kind of excel, um, and and they can end up providing you with several stops of extra light in certain situations where handshake could be a problem where you need longer exposures, um, and in those situations the mechanical stabilization systems are still you know really very good um, and. And the best kind of available solution. Um, but for the situation where you're talking about, where you've got a lot of motion and you're recording video, uh, they often are, are not uh, so so good. Uh, there, there is a because they're they're mechanical. There is there are very strong limits to how much movement is actually possible in the in the kind of the sensor plane or inside the lens elements, um, and how fast those things can actually move because they're mechanical. And in a video where you're moving a lot, where the camera is moving a lot, where there's a lot of motion in the scene, uh, the the uh, mechanical solutions are often unable to kind of keep up. And in those in those situations, they their their performance is often quite poor. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, I I've realised that myself. And uh, you know, there there have been solutions to to this. So so obviously, I'm not the only person that has suffered from uh, poor <laughs> stabilization output from, from my camera. There's, um, many people kind of suffer from this. Uh, and one way to correct for this, uh, is electronic image stabilization. Uh, and there, there's various elements to electronic image stabilization, but I guess to kind of, you know, from a high level, Ollie, what is electronic image stabilization uh, and how is it kind of, how is it used as a solution to, to some of, uh, the, the, this, this particular problem? So in, um, optical image stabilization, you're moving like a part of the lens or a camera, but in digital image stabilization, you're moving the pixels that you get out of the camera and um, try and correct for the shake. So that after the image has been um, captured, so you sort of you will shift maybe the pixels up if you're moving the camera up um, a little bit in order to counterbalance your accidental movements in your hand. Uh, and so, yeah, it, it takes the pixels as an array and transforms them in a way that you don't see the shake. Um, and yeah, a very simple version would be to move them linearly up and down or sideways to compensate. But um, that doesn't really deal well with rotations. So you, in general, will use um, a homography, which is just like a, a matrix multiplication. And it's quite simple um, and it can be defined quite easily. And you just apply that and sort of shift all the pixels on the in the image to, uh, to the side or sort of however, however you need to to compensate for your hand motion. Uh, and then you crop a, sort of a small bit down to get rid of the because on the edge, you'll, you'll sort of shift the image, and on the edge, you'll get these black pixels. So you crop down a little bit just to keep the video frame constantly filled with um, good pixels of what you want to shoot. And it stabilizes it very well, prevents the motion of your objects in the way that stabilization should, and it's great. Yeah, so you know, a few softwares now nowadays offer the ability to apply uh, digital electronic image stabilization once you've downloaded the footage. Uh, so for example, when I'm using Adobe Premiere Pro, I can apply a stabilization function to, to my footage. But again, sometimes uh, it's not very good. You know, um, not, not only am I suffering because my camera can't stabilize properly, but also uh, the software is not very good. You know, it's sometimes really unusable, uh, particularly when, uh, again, I'm, I'm vlogging and, and things are moving around in the background um, as I'm, you know, going up a hill. And when I'm moving as well, um, the it looks very, very shaky when I apply the the algorithm uh, on Premiere Pro, uh, and uh, it's like really, really jittery. So, so kind of, yeah. Why why does Premiere Pro suffer, or why do these kind of offline solutions suffer from from this jitteriness? So. Um... Yeah, as I mentioned, you, you want to move the pixels around. And that's actually quite an easy thing to do offline on these uh, programs. But it's the the working out how to move them that, that these programs often fall short on. Because they're just giving that you're just giving it a, a video that you've taken and all it has is the information in the video. And it's really difficult to recreate the camera position uh, from that and then and then create your new camera position. Because you're essentially saying, oh, the camera was here and it was moving in this way, shaking a lot. And I want to take out all those shakes and just move the camera smoothly like this. And so it's very easy to get mathematically from the shaky version into the smooth version, but it's really difficult to work out sort of what the initial shaky version was. Um, so that's uh, the yeah the, what the offline methods do if they don't have all the data from the camera maybe is to 
find features in the video from frame to frame. So say like a person's eye or something or something or something else that's easily identifiable in uh, one frame and then another. And then you um, you can find see the path, uh, the way that that's moved in the frame and try and stabilize that. So say you're, yeah, you're rotating down so this person's face is moving up. You want to try and compensate for that. So you, you keep it, you keep that person's face steady essentially. Um, and the reason why that breaks down often is because it's not a very easy thing to do. It's not a very precise thing to do. Uh, and so you'll get like, it'll track the wrong kind of image or it'll track like a sort of a beam of light that goes away or something moving in the foreground will distract it. Um, so it's, it's really hard to get the camera positioned from this data, which is why they fall short. Obviously, there has been solutions, and I, I guess I'm setting myself up <laughs> to to kind of reveal the, the the solution to some of this. But you know, before going into the solution and, and some of the work you've been doing specifically, Ollie, around uh, uh, the, the, these problems that, that we've identified, uh, one you know, a few one particular device that does stabilization very very well is uh, smartphones, um, and smartphones, uh, you know, have been able to crack this problem uh, of not only correcting for kind of um, optical and in-body stabilization, but also the, the problems with uh, offline electronic image stabilization. Uh, and what they do use is, is gyroscopic data uh, to help the, uh, the computer understand the camera's position or, or moment whilst it, whilst the video is being shot. And it uses that information to correct stabilization. So you'll notice with like some of the latest smartphones um, or, or, or small action cameras that uh, the footage is, is very stable and very smooth. Um, so why is it, Oli, that, that gyroscope data is, is, is helpful uh, to correct for um, the, the kind of issues with uh, electronic image stabilization? Well, yeah, that's the beauty of the gyroscope is that it just gives you the mathematical um, or the, the sort of the, the measured rotation at a single point from your camera. And it gives you it pretty exactly. They're, they're really great in modern gyroscopes and they give it to you a really high frequency. And so you're not depending. You, you, you can recreate the whole camera path from these rotations really easily. And you're not depending on these features and this identification, which is quite a complicated process. And you're instead just saying, oh, I have this really easy sort of four dimensional mathematical thing that I've been given. And I can easily turn that into the transformation which we need to make this video really steady. Um, so it's yes, that high high frequency really helps and the, and the accuracy and the precision that it gives you um, is all just, yeah, leagues, leagues ahead of a feature tracker. Yeah, okay, so, so Liam, uh, some cameras don't have gyroscopic data and some cameras do. Uh, will Alice have, have a gyroscope inside to help correct for some of these problems uh, that, that we've been identifying? Uh, yes, absolutely. Alice will have a gyroscope. I'll have a, a gyroscope specifically designed for electronic image stabilization that will give it the um, precise motion of the camera um, in, in real time, at very nice high frequency, so that we can run uh, we can run Ollie's electronic image stabilization algorithm in real time um, on the camera. Great. And and how would it how would it kind of works uh, from a from a software app perspective? So for those who don't know, uh, because the Alice camera attaches to the back of your your smartphone and your smartphone acts as a uh, control interface for the camera, uh, how will the stabilization kind of workflow uh, work in practice for for the end user? Um, so when uh, uh, when you're taking a recording a video with Alice, um, the uh, video stabilization will be enabled um, by default, uh, and it will be set to a certain level, which will have predetermined to be kind of kind of the, the right sort of level for most use cases. Uh, there will be a, a level of control made available to you so that you can uh, adjust exactly how how strong the stabilization is, um, because there are some there are some trade offs, um, and the more stabilization that you want, uh, the more cropping that is required. So the lower the resolution that you actually get out at the end, uh, but that trade that trade off will actually be made available to the user via a slider or some other sort of control, so that you can you can actually control that trade off yourself and and, and and kind of adjust the amount of stabilization to to what you want from your situation. Yeah, great. Um, and uh, just to be clear about uh, in-body stabilization, Alice uh, will not be having in-body stabilization. That is correct. However, um, there are quite a few micro four thirds lenses um, made mostly by Panasonic, as I understand, which uh, have optical image stabilization. Mm -hmm. and that, that will actually still work with us. Um, so you will be able to use optical image stabilization with Alice. Uh, or you'll be able to use electronic Im image stabilization with Alice. Uh, but yes, you will not be able to use IBIS. 
Right, and and actually, the you know the combination of optical and electronic stabilization uh, is a combination that Panasonic cameras uh, actually champion quite quite a bit, and, and uh, the outputs of those seem to be seem to be quite good. Uh, cool, but you know, going back a bit more back uh, to, to Ollie, your kind of um, your methodology and the computational methods that that you're that that you were discussing. Let's. Let's just spend a couple of minutes diving a little bit deeper into, into these methods. So, um, okay, so the video is being shot. Uh, you will be able to control the level of uh, stabilization. Uh, the camera is going to use the gyroscopic data to, to kind of correct for it. Uh, what, what are kind of the steps involved here? And, and maybe also at the end, kind of talk a little bit about um, rolling shutter because i understand that you know uh, our sensor and and most sensors are are, are rolling shutter sensors uh, and and because of this this feature functionality uh, it does impact stabilization to some extent yeah absolutely um so the stages the general stages are you capture your video on your sensor um, and you're also capturing this gyroscope data and you can recreate from that gyroscope data an orientation um, in a vector form, if, you, if, if that's, yeah, that's how it's done. Um, and then you can turn that sort of vector that you have for your position in space into a transformation, um, which is then applied for each and every pixel in that photo. And so it'll kind of, if you imagine, say, you're looking at a piece of paper flat, and then you tilt it sideways, or tilt it a little bit, because you've rotated your your viewpoint, and you you can you can see the perspective in that, um, and you have like a sort of a, a rhombus is uh, created uh, a, tra a trapeze, and it's what you're trying to essentially do to uh, the image is to turn it into that kind of trapeze, so that it's a correct for your for your um, perspective shift when you rotate the camera, um, and there are actually different uh, ways of doing image stabilization, and not everyone uses this homography transformation, but it does seem to be the most efficient and the best, um, because most of your it, it doesn't account for sort of uh, linear transformations in hand movements, but in general, when you're shooting a film, your the largest um, motion is in your hand rotating from side to side, um, and that's how the that's why the objects move. Not really because you're moving up and down. So this yeah, this homography method um, only corrects for angle angular rotation. So that seems to be yeah, like ninety nine percent of use cases of what, what's what's actually appropriate, and it's by far the most stable way of um, transforming video. So yeah, you apply this, you get your new array of pixels, you crop it down so you get rid of the old pixels, and then that's, yeah, that's your output, really. Um, rolling shutter is really interesting. It's uh, the way that uh, cameras cope with the uh, large amounts of data coming through in a video is to uh, take the video one line at a time, basically, to read off the video one line at a time from the sensor. And this means that each each layer of the, or sort of each row of pixels is read out at a different time, so you get <clears throat> slightly different yeah, type points of view at each time. So say if you're panning from side to side, uh, a vertical object will be slightly tilted because you're you're getting it at different time points on the sensor. Um, and this is actually something that we can correct for quite easily with gyroscope data because it's got high enough frequency and it's accurate enough that you can take slices of the image and transform each of them differently with a different homography um, to due to yeah your different orientation at each point. Uh, so we can entirely correct for running shutter. Um, which is great because not many cameras have a global shutter. It's very, very expensive cameras in general do, and they're not very practical. Um, so yeah, very exciting stuff. And I'm sure for those listening, um, uh, you're getting a kind of a, a more deeper understanding of kind of how electronic image stabilization works, uh, and and maybe you know some of the maths uh, uh, and the, the the geometry, but behind how it works. Um, to take this this forward, I know this is not something we're explicitly looking at at the moment. But there have been uh, some methods proposed in the academic literature about applying uh, machine learning or deep learning techniques to stabilization. Uh, maybe just to give the audience a flavor of, of, of some of these techniques, is there any ad advances or, uh, um, let's say, sorry, advantages of um, using machine learning and deep learning for this particular problem? Um, yeah, there are there are some. Um, so there are some disadvantages to electronic image stabilization um, over optical Im image stabilization systems. Um, and one of those is that um, electronic image stabilization, as it is at the moment, and as Ollie has described it, doesn't compensate for motion blur. Um, so when you, if you're moving the camera around quickly, um, and your shutter speed is not very fast, uh, you'll obviously get get motion blur, like just just from your camera motion. Um, and 
electronic image stabilization doesn't remove that um, explicitly, whereas optical or in-body image stabilization will actually be able to remove that, that motion blur. And this can cause artifacts in electronic image stabilization uh, footage, um, uh, where you know the the the, the kind of the, the point of view is is very stable because it's been stabilized very well, but uh, there's still blur um, within the image, which kind of comes and goes, and it can be quite distracting if 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 it's done if it's if it's quite bad, it can be very distracting. Um, but this is uh, something that uh, can be removed using electronic uh, or, or software techniques as well. Um, some techniques can use AI as well to do this, and some techniques can use more traditional, uh, more traditional processing methods. Uh, to, and, 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 and this is something that's being worked on at the moment to actually remove that motion blur computationally. Um, there are a few other uh, kind of things that you can correct for. So you can you can also use AI and machine learning to predict. Um, how uh, predict intentional camera movement, um, and uh, so so as not to remove intentional camera movement, but to remove any kind of deviations from that intentional camera movement. So this is like, for example, when you're deliberately panning, you know, panning around to follow somebody moving, or just to kind of look around. Um, you you don't want your stabilization um, algorithm to remove that panning motion because you actually want that panning motion in the in the final scene but you do want it to remove kind of vertical um, vertical vibrations along that move, movement and you want a nice smooth movement you don't want it jerking you want it a nice you want it a nice smooth movement and you, you can actually use AI and ML to predict when people are moving the camera deliberately and when they're moving it accidentally and to suppress accidental uh, movements but allow uh, deliberate movements. Uh, and this is something that um, the Google Pixel team have been investigating and have written about. Um, and it's something that, that um, is, is under active development. Um, and so there are going to be quite, I think, quite exciting advances within computational photography um, and image stabilization over the next few years. Um, which will, uh, in, in my in my view, close the gap quite significantly between electronic image sta in, electronic stabilization and optical or mechanical stabilization, um, and and I think we'll see electronic methods improving very significantly. Great, right? So uh, thanks so much for that. You know, to draw the conversation to a close and kind of in conclusion, uh, we you know we looked at. Um, optical stabilization and image stabilization and how these are mechanical methods used traditionally by digital cameras to solve the problem of stabilization. Uh, and we also you know, discussed uh, electronic methods, uh, offline techniques and online techniques, um, and um, how gyroscopic data can, can be used to, to make those online techniques more, more reliable. Um, but there still seems to be pros and cons to, to both methods. Uh, in, in, in the case of taking images, for example, and when you want to control for motion blur, it does seem that optical and, and in-body stabilization can, can be advantageous. Uh, but in situations where you want to record video uh, and there's a lot of movement, then electronic image stabilization might be uh, more advantageous. Uh, but looking into the future, there seems to be some very interesting research uh, in the domain of, of kind of artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, that can improve electronic image stabilization to, to, uh, to kind of be even advantageous in, in situations when you want to take images. Uh, and the Alice Camera team and, and what we're doing here is that we are very excited about all of these developments. Uh, and um, we're very committed uh, to, to use computational methods, um, artificial intelligence and deep learning techniques to solve a whole variety of, of problems with digital cameras. And through these uh, conversations in computational photography, you'll get a better understanding of um, how we are, are currently tackling those problems and what we intend to do in the future. Uh, so I do hope you continue to uh, tune into these conversations uh, next week or, or potentially the week after, because uh, I'll be away on uh, annual leave. Uh, we might look into uh, um, auto exposure and then auto focus. Uh, and we're also lining up some guest speakers to come in and talk about some of their research as well uh, at the cutting edge of computational photography and, and things with uh, consumer cameras. Um, so with that out of the way, um, I'd like to thank Liam uh, and Ollie again for, for joining us and talking about stabilization. Thank you, guys. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And hope you guys tune in. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch soon. Take care.